dad about it. <laughs> 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 They want to hear your latest joke. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, most of the countries would like to see us intervene more than we do for various reasons, including smoothing. Uh, the Canadians, the Germans, and the British are the least interested. And they made some very supportive statements publicly as well as in the meetings uh, suggesting we're on the right track. Uh, the French and the EC community may advocate frequent large-scale intervention. Um, for example, Minister Delors uh, stated after our agreement that he felt burned again, that uh, we were saying there hadn't been a change and he's alleging there was. We do not believe we can fully satisfy the demands of the French government. The French and the Italians, of course, want support for their weak currencies. They're pursuing inflationary policies. Their currencies go down, and they would uh, love to help us uh, uh, keep them up. The EC Commission argues for more intervention, and I think it's primarily because they would like authorization to operate a broader scheme uh, similar to the EMS, uh, which attempts to fix exchange rates in the short run. The Japanese would like intervention because they would like a stronger game. And uh, we, along with them, believe that this would uh, diffuse some of the protectionist, protectionist interest in our country and in other countries if, in fact, the yen were to go up. Uh, our basic conclusion is that we should retain our present policy. Uh, Short-term movements and exchange rates are no problem. They can be hedged. Uh, intervention cannot change exchange rate levels or trends, and that was pointed out in the report. We're bucking something we can't win if we try it. Uh, Wide-scale intervention uh, assumes that government officials know better than the marketplace uh, what the right price is, and I'm dubious about that assumption. Uh, intervention also represents a potential waste of taxpayer money, because you're likely to be on the wrong side of the market uh, buying something that's going down, and you lose in the process. Uh, and furthermore, we believe that large-scale intervention would destabilize the market by scaring uh, the actors in the market not knowing what the ground rules are. In conclusion, we believe we succeeded in convincing our partners uh, that attaining sustainable growth and low inflation is absolutely critical for achieving more stable exchange rates. Mr. President, uh, Bill Miscannon is here for Marty Feldstein to talk about the yen uh, dollar alignment or some refer to it misalignment. I go to some, just left a briefing for the structure to some of the meetings so that you'll have a chance for the leaders to, I suppose everyone has aspired to that, but to relax and to talk and chat and, and uh, that there's plenty of homework been done on it so he'll be well prepared on the interview. I do too. But that probably be the best part of it. Well, that's what they're letting Fred Trudeau was down here last week, and he repeated that hope himself, and uh, that, that they would keep it as The French, of course, Mitterrand was down there a couple of years ago. That's right. You probably remember for the Yorktown Battle of Yorktown Centennial Survey of Sub-Serum Celebration. It was very, 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 good. Good. very generous of the president. You probably heard on the radio this morning that you accepted the pleasure and said you to do it. <laughs> You know, that's just a good example of the, these friends are folks, something like that. And I said, well, I didn't know how the president, I'm not presumptuous enough to speak to him about it. So I said, well, I'll better leave it. But the main thing is not to have pressure so he and his, his advisors can make a decision, do what's ever best in terms of him, his reelection, and all of that. That was all in there. So it comes out. These generous comments that Fernando was mentioning, and then it said that Bush said he could take it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was upset as heck. About that. <laughs> Be pleased to know we conducted a private poll through uh, Lance Torrance, Teresa, in California, that showed the president playing against Mondale, <laughs> Glenn, and uh, France, Eva at this early stage. Well, there's a nonpartisan commission. How do we drop, drift off into partisan? <laughs> <laughs> How are the presidents doing? Doing well. Yes. Yeah, good health. Yes. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Yes. Yeah.
free enterprise and uh, helping them to become able to help themselves. Uh, some there weren't that enthused about the idea, but you know, if you look at the evidence around the world, those emerging countries that have done that and turned to private enterprise, uh, from Taiwan to uh, Singapore to South Korea compared to North Korea to wherever you go, uh, and even in Africa, the same thing, and those that turn them go to statism uh, seem to be in trouble and their, uh, their standard of living doesn't rise at all. And this is what's back of the Caribbean initiative, the idea of here's government, but also I asked a committee at that time to go and see what they could do privately in the islands down there. And I, now I know there are some people in the country that think when you talk about that that you're going to be exporting jobs or something. But I also remember that Winston Churchill once, he never said this publicly, but I know that he said privately in a conversation, expressed his belief that while our, the world's intention of wanting everybody to rise up and be able to live on the standard of the rest of us, but that it was impossible because the world could not, there weren't the means in the world to, uh, to bring that about. Well, I, I disagree with him on that. I think that the more effective you make a country and the more you improve its own economy, uh, the more you increase the number of customers that can buy the things which countries like ours want to sell. If you stopped and looked at all the rest of the world and imagined if every one of them was in the market for an automobile right now. <laughs> it could do. I know we may not get to that, but uh, this is why I believe, what I believe uh, you can do it. And uh, I think a good place to start is right here in our own hemisphere with our neighbors up and down America. And the, uh, I just, I'm grateful to you for it and I place my belief in the magic of the marketplace. Nothing government's ever been able to do can quite compare with it. Well, we certainly appreciate you taking a few moments to see us, Mr. President. Uh, as we went around the table, I introduced uh, Duane and, and Mr. Parker as the chairman and, and co-chairman, respectively, of this uh, this group. Uh, Duane, perhaps you have a comment or two about. We got a pretty good morning, a bunch of briefings, and then this well, afternoon we break into subgroups. That we came here to go to work for you, Mr. President. Yeah. And uh, we're starting out by uh, uh, discovering the problems, and we hope we can wind up by giving you some solutions. 
But I believe, uh, from what I've heard, most of the people, all of the people on this commission, agree with the points of view that you have expressed and that you expressed in Cancun, which we're familiar with. I have read carefully. Uh, I wanted to point out to you that we will undertake to study the entire global climate for foreign aid. Foreign aid has evolved over a period of 20 years in the experience of most of our business lifetimes here. And I would like to point out, for example, in the early, say, about 20 years ago, when Ludwig Gerhardt was in charge of West Germany, uh, creating the economic miracle, working in a socialist state, but being a great advocate of free enterprise. Gerhard more or less cast the die for the policies of our friends and allies abroad. I remember having a conversation with him, which I've never forgotten. We were discussing the possibility of the United States and Germany having a, a, a coordinated aid program. He said, I don't see how we can do that because he said, my idea of good foreign aid is trade. Trade is aid. And he said, uh, we are willing to spend probably 1% of our GNP on a hard concept of aid. But it's a little different than your concept. And so I remember his saying it'd be like apples and oranges. He said that they could make many, many things in Germany that were badly needed in the third world countries, like plows, tractors, irrigation pumps, many hundreds of things. To create jobs in Germany, and since they depended on exports as we now do, create jobs in the third world countries as well, and establish a linkage of business community instead of government to government between the countries. But he said uh, we will spend our aid money to assist those exports. <coughs> now, this finally became the policy since he was a strong man in the Western Europe and the common markets was accepted pretty much as the policy of the French in their old colonies, the policy of the British, and ultimately the Brazilians and the Japanese. But they concentrated their foreign aid on export subsidies of one kind or another, special credits, mixed credits, all kinds of ways. I, I know that even recently at the Bilderberg Conference, Helmut Kohl and Lambsdorff, you know, the, the economic minister there now, spoke of it again as foreign aid. It's just like we said our Export-Import Bank is a foreign aid institution. It's a different political concept. And they have charged and supercharged <coughs> economies with these myriad of export subsidies, which is spread to almost every industry. Until in agriculture alone, the common market spends $10 billion exporting foodstuffs. Now, the result is that our workers are competing not with other workers, and our farmers not with other farmers, and our corporations not with other corporations. We are all competing with the treasuries of these uh, mercantile states. You have five mercantile states that have grown out of this concept, and the, the birth of this concept was foreign aid, and we've gotten a long ways from it. We don't think of it that way anymore. But nevertheless, that's the kind of world we live in, and we have to take that into consideration. And it may be that we'll find it's necessary to enlarge our concept of foreign aid, to include more export programs in order to make jobs here and jobs over there. Uh, I don't know what recommendations we'll come up with, but certainly uh, your new trade organization. Certainly foreign aid is an integral part of trade in the world economy today. And undoubtedly, we'll have to look for some